what we do in the future, because this is really about a little bit about looking backwards, but it's mostly about looking forward. And uh, Adrian and Andra have really put together uh, a wonderful program. Uh, they have made all these arrangements. I don't think anybody appreciates how much it takes in terms of logistics to pull something like this off. And we're, we're very pleased that this has become an annual event. Um, my own introduction to uh, reentry and uh, was really rather traumatic. I had uh, been in India for a year. I'd been working in a rural area that was extremely poor. I had seen a level of uh, poverty and deprivation that I didn't know existed. And uh, I came home to Chicago where my parents were living at the time. My father was a hotel manager. And he ran a hotel in downtown Chicago that had a revolving restaurant on the top of it. And uh, we went to dinner there about three days after I'd been back. And at that time, I had a sister who was, she's considerably younger than I am. And at that time, she was about 13 years of age. And she ordered what I considered to be an outrageously expensive meal. Not that we were paying for it, but it was expensive. And she played with her food throughout most of the meal. And at some point, I simply lost it. I stood up in the middle of this very fancy restaurant and started to lean over and scream at my sister how there were people in the world who were starving to death and that what did she think she was doing and my father sort of grabbed my arm and sat me down and said, you know, get a grip. And I didn't realize then that I was actually in the midst of really pretty severe re-entry shock. It was a shock about socioeconomic conditions, it was a shock about just everything that my senses, it was an overload, even somewhat more than it had been before I had gone, because India I was partly prepared for, but I wasn't prepared to come back to a level of affluence that I had forgotten even existed in the world. In my own university, I had students beginning uh, after I came to the University of the Pacific in the Jurassic, which was about 1976. And a series of students came to my office and said, I'm losing my mind. I've changed my friends, I've changed my living situation, I've changed my major. My parents and I aren't getting along very well, and I think I'm losing my mind. And I said, well, where have you been? And they said, well, I was there for a year in Japan. And after the 15th or 16th student came by who thought that they were the only person that was having an issue with being back, I said, you know, it's perfectly reasonable, it's perfectly logical that you should be having some of these kinds of reactions. But at that point, there literally was almost no literature and there was almost no support for students who were coming back from overseas. And so that was the beginning of my professional involvement which has now lasted 33 years with trying to provide some of those materials because it's what you do with the program and with your experiences after you return home that really are part of, and in fact, a critical part of the application of how you're going to make that part of your life uh, much more of a success than you've already had so far. So this isn't the end of your trip, this is really the beginning of it, and we want to do everything today. There are some extraordinary people here who are going to be giving you their expertise on how to prepare and other opportunities to go abroad again, and so please take full advantage of that. And anybody that's here uh, who has volunteered to do this, um, be willing to talk with you about any issue that you have. Uh, this is really about you and your experience, and, and again, we really welcome you to this day. Okay? All right, thanks, Bruce. We just wanted to give you a little bit of the unofficial story of how we ended up standing in front of you today. You got a very wonderful bio-based background to us, but my guess is you care a little bit more about the kinds of experiences that we've had that have led us to do what we do with our lives. So 10 years ago, at this time, I was studying abroad in Salamanca with IES. Do we have any people who are in Salamanca at IES with Danielle and Concha? Yeah? <laughs> and um, it was a fantastic experience for me. I actually grew up in a bicultural family, so I always had a real strong interest in cultural dynamics. But I really chose to make a career out of my experience. I came back, it was 2001 when I graduated from Northwestern. The economy was similar to the economy now, not fantastic. People had job offers that were actually being rescinded as the economy went down. So it was a tough time to find a job. And I decided to um, avoid finding a job and spend the summer traveling around. 
and then took a job basically where I was um, in charge of launching a skincare line to Spanish-speaking women. It was a really interesting opportunity for me, but I woke up one day and I said, you know, if I'm really successful at this job, all it means is that more Spanish-speaking women are wearing skincare products. Do I feel really good about myself? No. <laughs> so it launched me onto a completely different path. I ended up teaching in Japan. I moved then from Japan to the south of France, where I started doing what is called cross-cultural training. And my role, and it's the work that I continue to do today, is one where I go in and I work with organizations and with multinationals who have people from all different backgrounds working together. And my role is to help them to understand what is the impact of culture on the way that you work together and how do you work together more effectively knowing that you have these different cultural backgrounds. It's an extremely rewarding career. Um, I, it ends up taking me to anywhere between 6 to 12 countries every year. Um, and it, it allows, allows me to continue to do what it is that I love to do, which is travel and learn and learn about culture. Uh, but I'll tell you this, it hasn't been an easy path. There's no pre-med, there's no pre-culture sort of program that you go through, so you have to blaze your own trail and decide what it is that you want to do. And as you can tell from sort of the non-linear path that I took to get where I am, there's a lot of different options that are available to you. And so what we're here to do basically today is three things. First, to really look at what are some of the challenges that we face when we um, are coming back from moving abroad and understand that process of coming back home. I was saying to Bruce because my next move in August will be to Copenhagen in Denmark and that'll be a, a move for a year because of actually my husband's work. But I was saying to Bruce, I almost have a reverse um, challenge now. I get nervous when, I, when I'm not in transition. I think something's wrong, right? <laughs> and the reason being that most of my growth has come from periods of transition, and so I see them now, even though they're difficult. So we're going to talk about why are transition, why is it our transition hard, specifically for transitioning back from a study abroad experience, and then what are some strategies that you can do to ensure that you're really making the most of your experience and managing yourself through that process. And we really want to end today by bringing it into a really practical fo focus, which is you all want to get out there and probably do something with yourselves after you graduate. And it's a question of how do you keep that experience alive and make it something that is an asset for you as you do any kind of job search moving forward. So those are our goals for today. We want to find out a little bit about who's in the room. We've got a big group today. So what I just want to see is, let me ask you this. First, by, by show of hands, how many of you just came back Sometimes over at the end between this and right. Okay, so a number of you. And then we put your hands down. How many of you came back sometime in the summer? All right. And do we have anyone who came back earlier? So our, our group of seasoned <laughs> attorneys so looks in this area if you want to go and find them and seek their guidance because they're a few months ahead of you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is how long did you spend abroad? How many of you went for one quarter or one semester? Okay, looks like the majority. How about a year? Any of you go for longer than a year? Okay, how long were you abroad? Two years. Wow, okay, good. So it's an interesting dynamic. You see that there's a lot of variety of experiences within the room. Um, and it's something to be mindful of because a lot of people have really different kinds of experiences and there's a lot of wonderful resources within this room. So the, one of the key values of this conference is you talking with other people about their experiences. The last question we have is to find out where you study. And we're going to up the challenge a little bit. What I'd like everyone to do, this is going to be a silent activity, is to stand up and you're going to have three minutes 